Hi, I'm Nairi Zaraga. I'm a scientist at the Chicago Botanic Garden, and we're here in the tropical greenhouse where we have this lovely breadfruit tree planted that you can see here. This breadfruit tree is about one and a half years old, and it'll get much larger. Breadfruit trees are tropical trees, um, so we cannot grow it in other parts of the Chicago region besides inside tropical greenhouses. Breadfruit has been cultivated for thousands of years in the South Pacific Islands, where it has been a traditional starch source and major crop there. It's like a big potato on a tree in, in some ways. You can roast it, mash it, boil it, and also ferment it for long-term storage. Our first recorded records of breadfruit come from uh, European explorers from the late 1600s. The European explorers coined the term breadfruit because they had been on open sea voyages for months and months, eating all kinds of rationed food and had not had fresh bread for months. When they got onto the islands, they were um, greeted by uh, native islanders who served them roasted breadfruit, and it tasted a lot like fresh bread. And that's how it got its name. The Europeans quickly realized the utility of this amazing tree and soon wanted to introduce it to other parts of the world. In the late 1700s, the British Crown commissioned a, sh a ship called the Bounty that was headed by Captain Bly, and it headed towards Tahiti to procure breadfruit to bring to the British colonies in the Caribbean. As many of you know, that ship never made it to the Caribbean. And one of the most infamous mutinies on the open seas occurred, the Mutiny on the Bounty, for which there are several books and movies that will go into much more detail. I do research here at the Botanic Garden on the breadfruit. I'm interested in knowing where it came from, what its wild ancestors were, what kind of diversity it has so we can conserve it. So I use a technique called DNA fingerprinting, which is just like any other technique you've heard about for crime scenes. And what I'm trying to do is unravel the mystery of when, where, and how breadfruit was domesticated. So from the DNA fingerprinting data, we found that there are two ancestors that gave rise to the over 100 different cultivars of breadfruit that we find today throughout the Pacific Islands. One, the common name is called breadnut, and it's native to New Guinea. And the other one, it's commonly called Dug Dug, and it's native to the Mariana Islands and Palau. We know now from DNA fingerprinting that breadfruit found in Melanesia and Polynesia come only from the breadnut, from New, New Guinea. And breadfruit that we find in Micronesia is actually the result of hybridization between early breadfruit cultivars and the Dug Dug. So this has given rise to a tremendous amount of diversity that's important to conserve. I'm Mary McLaughlin with Trees That Feed. I grew up in Jamaica eating breadfruit, so I knew the value of how important it could be to a country, especially a country that's looking at economic issues as they're importing a lot of, of food to feed their people. The breadfruit trees in Jamaica tend to produce fruit in one particular season. This is what the fruit looks like. It's usually a little bit bigger. When you roast it, it tastes exactly, I think, like a bagel or it's like a potato on a tree. In season, we have a lot of wasted fruit. However, if we could find a way of, of getting other cultivars that beard at different seasons, then we could have seasonal production all year. Also, our foundation, Trees at Feed, is looking at ways of preserving the fruit. So we work with the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota and um, compatible technologies. They try to do research to help people in the poorest countries of the world, helping with food abatement. So the University of St. Thomas has developed a technique of drying the fruit and turning it into flour. So they take this fruit, needs no electricity, then they air dry it and turn it into chips. And the chips can be stored for years, just in their dried form. And then these chips can be, chips can be ground and turned into flour. Once you have the breadfruit flour, which is gluten-free, it can be preserved, packaged, sold, and used to make, you can't make bread out of it because it's gluten-free, but you can make things like pancakes, flatbreads, tortillas. We work with the National Tropical Botanical Gardens, and there they have found a particular cultivar, which is this cultivar, the mafala, originating in Samoa, and it's, when it's dried, it's 7% protein which means that you're not just getting your regular carbohydrate meal, but you're getting your carbohydrate portion of your meal with a little bit of protein. Trees That Feed Foundation 
so far has planted about 4,000 trees. We've planted in Jamaica and we've planted in Haiti. We're working in areas of um, the northern part of Haiti. We've been given help with um, finding groups with the Clinton Foundation, groups that are working on reforestation in Haiti. So we're planting the trees there. We're looking to plant trees in orphanages in Haiti and in schools as well. And also we're collaborating with universities in, Porto, in Haiti and in Jamaica to do research in creating breadfruit flour. So we're looking to help countries that have the poorest people in the world that are looking at um, feeding themselves instead of importing a large portion of the food. And we really think that this tree can really not just reforest, but feed so many of the world's hungriest people.